because uh, it, it became law over Governor Baker's veto, uh, then uh, very conservative, truly very conservative residents across Massachusetts gathered the signatures to uh, to go to the ballot. And so quickly, you know, SAIU and so many progressive organizations had to turn around and raise the money and, and do the grassroots to convince voters to say yes to reaffirming that law for for licenses for for immigrants so that was something i was you know very active in um so those are two solid victories that you're talking about decades of, of organizing and discussing on um you know the effort to pass a constitutional amendment or a, a progressive income tax i think it failed four times before in massachusetts so um so very pleased with that um you know I, it would not have happened without activists across Massachusetts doing that organizing, especially when you look at how close the the millionaire's tax vote was. Um, I do think it's important to have a reflection on, you know, messaging, um, the language of the ballot, um, because, you know, despite the fact that most voters uh, did from consistent polling say that they would support uh, taxing th those who are wealthier, it was a very close vote. And I would say the opposition, while they certainly had some money, um, they weren't particularly organized. So, you know, I think that's a discussion about um, do we need to have more conversations with middle of the road voters, uh, with some working class voters, uh, some of whom did surprisingly vote against uh, question one, um, as well as just, you know, getting down to the details of every ballot question, because I know something that came up for a lot of middle class uh, voters was the the so-called uh, tax on if you sold your house or business and how that would impact uh, paying this millionaire's tax, even if it was just once. So I, I just think it's important to to think about all the thought and, and polling and, and organizing that goes into every single ballot question if we really want to be successful, because certainly we've had other ballot questions. I'm thinking about, you know, all of the healthcare battles over the past 15 years where, you know, where we've lost um, and that brings up, you know, something I think for, you know, this conference and just so happy that so many uh, progressive organizations are, are part of this, um, you know, it's not just mass peace action, um, is what is the future for, for Raise Up Mass? That's the coalition that, you know, advocated for both of these ballot questions. Uh, is that going to continue? Um, it's mostly funded by, by union money. Um, what is the what is the plan to take on other issues? I have been uh, consistently frustrated that we haven't made a lot of progress on health care uh, since the, the 2006 uh, so-called uh, Romney care, um, which obviously was not single payer, but it, it also wasn't even public option. So, you know, is there is there the opportunity to do a ballot campaign I think single payer is very difficult at the ballot uh, because of the money that will be spent against it. Is there a chance for the public option? Are there other aspects of universal health care that we should look at to get behind, recognizing that as much as I'd like to see the, the legislature take that on, and, and perhaps we have an opportunity with a, a Democratic governor coming in with more Healy, it's not yet clear uh, if the legislature is really willing to take on the the sort of corporate healthcare special interests uh, to to make healthcare much more accessible and much more affordable. Um, so healthcare uh, could be something we take up. Um, we just had a fantastic press conference uh, two days ago, uh, so on Thursday morning, with uh, labor unions, MTA, and AFT on public higher education. Uh, there is the bill debt college, which is a bill I filed to make uh, college and vocational school free in Massachusetts. There's the bill, the Cherish Act. Uh, with the passage of the millionaire's tax, we're, we're going to have a lot of money uh, to invest in public higher ed. So what is the conversation around getting there for next session uh, in terms of investing more in public higher ed, but also, you know, the more universal goal of of, of debt free college or, or free college. So, is that a ballot question that we we should pursue? Um, so, I just think it's important to reflect upon that because I think that raise up mass right now is a point where it's not clear what will be next. And and I think you know what we should all be so proud about is that 
when we have gone to the ballot with progressive legislation, whether $15 an hour minimum wage, paid sick time, uh, or, or obviously the millionaire's tax or the driver's license law, we've won. So that's that's very encouraging. On the on the election uh, scene, I, I think it's safe to say that uh, for progressives, there there were a lot of disappointments in the in the primary in the Democratic primary. Um, just focused on you know the the legislature. I, I think it was sort sort of a <clears throat> a mixed bag. Uh, we had a lot of open seats. Uh, there were also some challenges to to more conservative Democrats uh, that were mostly unsuccessful. Um, some of the open seats, we did have some successes, and I, I think that's a conversation around what are we doing to prioritize certain races? Uh, look, you know, there every two years there are so many legislative races going on. Um, I know that we all uh, work hard on, you know, often our our local state rep or state rep races, but is there the need to sort of bring together a table, if you will? of progressive organizations to say, these are the 20 races that we should focus on because there were a number of primary races uh, where where the the incumbent, uh, you know, won by a fairly small, you know, margin, uh, where there was someone that progressive groups endorsed. So, you know, what is the what is the dynamic of getting people from across the state to focus on a particular race and also, and and hopefully you know that I'm, you know, I was elected as a clean elections candidate. I continue to advocate for public financing, but you know, we need to make sure that progressive candidates are well funded, um, particularly candidates of color, particularly women that that have a variety of disadvantages of, of raising money. Is that what are we doing to make sure uh, that those that are coming from more working class districts, uh, from uh, for candidates of color, for women? Uh, what are we doing to to best support them? Um, because it it has been two consecutive legislative cycles where a lot of great progressive candidates uh, did not win their their primary. So I think that's very important to discuss. Um, and then uh, just the the further piece on the legislative races for the general elections is that that in my opinion was was mostly positive in that. Uh, because even in Massachusetts, the Republican Party continues to move to the right and, and really push their candidates to, to be to the right or, or they won't be supported or, or even their, their base won't help them in their respective districts they're running in, is that it looks like the Massachusetts House of Representatives will pick up about four or five more Democratic seats. Now, I will say the conversation for, you know, the Demo Democrats for progressives is, you know, just adding more Democrats to the legislature, but not having them be committed to progressive issues, you know, is something that is a is a consideration. It's a concern. You know, what where do Democrats stand on a, a wide variety of issues from, you know, LGBTQ rights to Roe v. Wade to uh, progressive taxation to protecting immigrants. Um, so I I. I think it's it, it shows the incompetence of the Republican Party in Massachusetts. Can the Democratic Party, can the Democratic legislature take advantage of that and say, OK, we have uh, more than a supermajority now in the House and Senate. We have a Democratic governor and Moore Healy, who's uh, did some terrific work as attorney general. You know what? What are we going to achieve if it's just going to be a repetition of uh, Governor Charlie Baker's record? Then what is the purpose of getting you know Democrats or, or progressives elected? And I guess the, the the final piece on you know constitutional officers is that you know I'd be the first to say uh, that I think you know there was um, uh, a bunch of different outcomes in the primaries for for statewide offices. I, I think that you know there there were progressives that were endorsing you know different different candidates. Um, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that's important to reflect upon now is that um, our constitutional officers can do so much. I think about, you know, the position of state treasurer, uh, you know, divesting from uh, uh, 
the military industrial complex, you know, one of the pieces of legislation I file is to is to require uh, the treasurer uh, to divest our pension funds from from Raytheon and other companies that produce military weapons. Um, there's the the climate, you know, divestment bill. Um, the treasurer oversees school buildings. Uh, why is it a requirement that every school building is not 100% clean energy? Um, why why are we getting away from um, adequate or, or uh, sufficient investment in public schools, especially in working class and poor communities that can't afford it at their local property taxes. So that's just you know a few examples of where you know I think one constitutional office could be going further. And so you know let's think about between now and January when you know all of these constitutional officers get sworn in uh, about what we're asking them to do. Obviously, the focus, the biggest focus, is is on. Attorney General Moore Healy becoming governor, uh, Mayor Kim Driscoll becoming lieutenant governor. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that there are still not a lot of details of, of uh, the platform for the Healy Driscoll administration. Um, I appreciate the fact that they formed a transition committee. Uh, lots of people weighing in, you know, go to their website to, to, to weigh in with your thoughts. But I get a little bit skeptical about transition committees and, and what their actual product is, is I, I think it's really about progressive groups coming together and having conversations between now and January, ideally to say, what are we going to advocate for? You know, I mentioned earlier this very powerful uh, press conference on Thursday morning on higher education. There were stakeholders from faculty, from students, uh, even from some business owners, and then obviously the, the labor unions. Um, that really had a very powerful press conference that re reminded me of the Promise Act press conference four years ago around passing uh, significant investment in K through 12 schools. So what can we do on healthcare? What can we do on transportation? Uh, what we can what can we do on next steps to better support immigrants uh, and other people of color? And I and I think it's really critical to have those conversations now because guess what the the corporate lobbyists. Uh, you know, legislators that uh, might identify as conservative or moderate. Uh, a lot of uh, business groups are already, you know, trying to get their seat at the table with the administration, and we need to be just as aggressive. So, so those are some of my thoughts, and and I think the last thing I would just say for for next session is that I think it has been uh, deeply disappointing that we have not passed any pro labor legislation in multiple sessions. Uh, there's the wage theft bill. Um, there's the bill to better protect municipal employees. Um, there is legislation uh, that would um, better support uh, increasing the wages uh, for a lot of human service workers that we really haven't made much of a difference on. So I think labor is a really key issue. Um, Health care, which I mentioned before, we, we have not uh, done any robust health care legislation in you know probably about a decade. Uh, public higher education, great, great opportunity there. Uh, but look, Massachusetts has among the greatest inequality uh, in the country, uh, and that includes a, a massive racial inequality gap. So there's a lot of work left to do and excited to do it. Uh, it's been as busy as ever uh, right now after the election and look forward to working with you all. And thanks so much for, for having me. I'm really honored to be one of the speakers alongside um, so many other prominent speakers. And thank you so much to, to all the groups uh, that they do. And thank you, special thanks to Cole and Mass Peace Action for very challenging and difficult and really important work. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. That was a great overview and a pretty challenging list of agenda items for us to deal with, but very, very illuminating and helpful to, to have that roadmap of opportunities and challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to call on John Nichols. He is the National Affairs Correspondent for The Nation. His most recent book is Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, Accountability for Those Who Caused the Crisis. He gave a talk this morning at nine, and that was his warm up. And he's now going to give an even better one uh, to us now. Over to you, John. Thank you, Cole. And and uh, that's always a, a terrible way to introduce somebody to say 
you're about to hear the best talk you've ever heard or something. <laughs> I will do my very best. And I'm super honored That's because you are going to. Well, <laughs> it's very kind of you, Cole. I'm super honored to be with everybody here. Uh, I want to thank Cole uh, for the convening role that he's played uh, and all of the other groups that are a part of this. Uh, I have worked with many of you over the years. I think especially of the uh, Progressive Democrats of America folks from Western Massachusetts, uh, Russell Friedman and others who I've, I've had the honor to appear with in person uh, over the years. And uh, I have to tell you, I am really ready for that, that session where we get together in person. I was uh, uh, excited to be invited to join you, but uh, disappointed when I found out we were gonna be on Zoom. Uh, not that I dislike Zoom, I've done a lot of it over the last couple of years, but the fact of the matter is, I do believe that that personal connection is still the way in which we form relationships and build things out. And, and I will tell you uh, that I have benefited tremendously by uh, the connections I've made, the, the insights I've gained from being with you folks over the years in Boston and, and other places in Massachusetts. And so I'm honored to be here. Also, one quick final note, I'm very honored to be on with Jamie Eldridge. The fact of the matter is, I look across the country at state legislators. I cover politics for a living. Uh, there is a handful, and it really is a handful of legislators who are absolutely committed to economic and social and racial justice, to saving the planet and to peace. And Jamie Eldridge is one of that handful coming from a complex district that uh, he has to actually work to win. And uh, you're just very lucky to have him in Massachusetts. And it is a testament to his commitment that he's here with us this morning. Uh, and so great, great honor and, and uh, really cherishing of Jamie Eldridge over many, many years. So let's talk about politics. Um, look, uh, if we were meeting three weeks ago, four weeks ago, boy, would we have been depressed, right? Because we were all watching the media. Uh, we can't delink ourselves as much as we might like to. And so we we're all watching media and social media. And what were we being told? Well, it was going to be a Republican wave, could be a Republican tsunami, literally that that uh, they were going to take the House and the Senate and governorships across the country. I even saw a report saying that there was a possibility that the Senate seat in Vermont uh, could go Republican. And, you know, I was like, whoa, what's going on there? You know, and, and of course, it was all wrong. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, we have a very failed media in this country. We have a very failed pundit class in this country. Uh, and frankly, we have a lot of political strategists who don't know what they're talking about. And so they always run the last election. They always imagine that uh, no matter what's going on, that, that nothing can change. We can't really progress. We're locked into patterns. We're locked into you know ways that things will happen. And so a midterm election is going to produce an overwhelming result for the party that is not in power. That's almost the, it's the sort of accepted fantasy, right? And it allows us no progress. Well, this year, uh, the people decided that they weren't going to go along with the accepted fantasy. And they did decide that they wanted progress. Now, it didn't, it's not universal. I'm not naive. I'm not going to give you a picture where it says everything turned out perfectly. It didn't. But the fact of the matter is you didn't get that overwhelmingly uh difficult and negative result that would have been undermining for, again, economic and social and racial justice for peace and saving the planet. And why did that happen? Well, I mean, we know the basics of it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the Republican Party, as uh, both Cole and Jamie and some other speakers have, have kind of revealed to us here, Jamie especially emphasizing it, has become something fundamentally different than the Republican Party was even five or six years ago. Now, I know that we've we've been, you know, criticizing the drift of the GOP to the right um, since, yeah, I don't know, since they let Strom Thurmond in in 1964. So it's it's been a long journey to the right, let's be very honest. But the, the fact of the matter is that um, the Republican Party went from being a ideologically diverse party in the 60s and 70s to a conservative party in the 80s and the 90s. Um, to in the 2010s, around the time of the Tea Party, to a more activist, populist, conservative party 
And now in the last five or six years, uh, particularly in the last two years, it has evolved in many cases toward an authoritarian party, toward a party that is genuinely, at least in many cases, anti-democratic, literally nominating people for office who deny the results of the previous election and who propose to get power and use it to suppress votes and to use that power to warp future elections. That is the, the very model of an authoritarian party. And so, I mean, it's pretty scary, right? And it's infused with Christian nationalism an extreme right uh, ideology rooted in a lot of racist thinking. It's infused with a lot of racism and xenophobia. And so this Republican party that went into this campaign uh, went in as a party that scared people. It's, it's as simple as that. And the fact is, a lot of people decided they did not want to have a scary government. And so the end result was that across the country, Democrats did far better in the midterm election than at any time since 1962. 1962 was the Cuban Missile Crisis election. John Kennedy was president at that time, and the Democrats did pretty well. But in fact, if you look at the actual breakdown where things turned out, you've got to go back to 1934. This was the best midterm election for Democrats in a first term of a new Democratic president since 1934, which is amazing. And what did they do? They held on to the Senate, which at one point was considered to be a very difficult thing. They came within three or four, maybe five seats in of holding the House, did not hold it, lost it, but you know came very close to holding it and created a situation where the Republicans will have a very difficult time managing under the leadership of so-called leadership of Kevin McCarthy. And then the most important story, and Jamie will appreciate this, was the states. In states across the country, Democrats actually did way better than expected. And uh, they picked up two governorships, one of them in Massachusetts. Um, they uh, had, and they only, it would be actually, they won three new governorships, but they uh, lost one in Nevada. Uh, but more importantly, Democrats who opposed election deniers won in seven, in the seven states where that was a, a prospect that an election denier would become secretary of state. Uh, in fact, they swept those states because of the battleground states in a presidential election. Every secretary of state's post is now held by someone who actually believes in democracy. Now, there's one Republican, uh, Brad Raffensperger, down in, in Georgia, who's frankly very troublesome on a lot of small d voting rights or small d democracy and voting rights issues. But at least he was willing to stand up to, to Donald Trump. So you have all the battleground states with someone who's at least willing to accept election results. Now, that's a pretty low standard, I understand, but it's something to understand that, that, that it was achieved. And in legislative races across the country, you see a situation, Jamie was talking about Massachusetts being now, you know, sort of a super majority or very, very democratic state. But this is the amazing thing. Michigan, which just a couple of years ago had a Republican governor and Republican legislature, now has Democrats in every statewide elected post and control Democrats control both houses of the state legislature. In Minnesota, Democrats now control the full governance of that state. And I point to several others across the country. So it was actually a very good election for Democrats. And one other thing, beyond partisan politics, it was a very good election for progressive ideas. Abortion rights, the right to choose, won uh, again and again in states across the country in referendums. Legalization of marijuana won even in many conservative uh, locations. Raising wages referendums won across the country. Democracy referendums to make it easier to vote won in places like Michigan and other states across the country. And so when we look down that list, pretty good result. Now, um, here's the bad news. That's all the good news. And I love, I love, I wish I could just give you good news. The bad news is it was still a status quo election, right? This, the, progressives, the left, made no great progress here. It wasn't like we moved toward a place where at the federal level, we're going to achieve bigger and bolder progressive legislation that we really are going to um, you know, address criminal justice issues, race, systemic racism, economic inequality, uh, the military industrial complex, You know, so many of the issues that we want to talk about today. Uh, do we move to a place where it's going to be easier to do that? No, we didn't. Because the House of Representatives will be under control of a Republican leadership that's going to be very different to the extreme right, 
it's going to be a very problematic situation. It's going to be harder for Joe Biden to govern. It's going to be harder for the Democrats to govern in general at the congressional level because of this change in the House of Representatives. We shouldn't deny that reality. What we should recognize, though, is that there are possibilities, and we'll talk a little, little bit about that, and we talked already a little about it. We'll talk about it some in the Q&A. There are possibilities for action on a number of fronts. Uh, we, I think it was Kathleen brought up earlier, uh, are there going to be areas where you could build coalitions, for instance, on military spending? The fact is that some of these very conservative Republicans are sympathetic to reducing some military spending. Progressives have to follow the lead of Barbara Lee, who has always been willing to meet with and work with Republicans to build coalitions, to cut military spending, to oppose war. And there'll be some openings there, although complex openings. Uh, there'll be a lot of battles going forward on social welfare issues. I think we're gonna be able to defend what minimal social welfare state we have. It's gonna be hard to make progress on that. Um, but I also think that as we head toward 2024, um, there's some very good prospects to keep in mind here. Uh, the Progressive Caucus in the House of Representatives is bigger than ever. Um, and it's adding remarkable young members who really are going to be leaders at the national level. Summer Lee in Pennsylvania, uh, elected to Congress from an area near Pittsburgh, beat uh, big money from APAC, the American Israel Political Action Committee, uh, or Public Affairs Committee, and, uh, and one of its uh, affiliated PACs, not just in her primary, but in her general election a huge victory for someone who is looking for peace in the Middle East, who's respectful of Israel and Palestine. That's an important victory. She comes in as somebody who can talk about these issues in ways that many, many other members have been cautious about doing. Um, in Texas, Greg Kassar, one of the great organizers in Texas, literally think of your one of your best organizers in Massachusetts and then imagine that person going to Congress. That's Greg Kassar coming out of the Austin area in Texas. In Illinois, Jonathan Jackson, Jesse Jackson's son, as well as Delia Ramirez coming to Congress as new, truly progressive members, and Maxwell Frost out of Florida. We can run down the list. These are going to be people you'll know in short order if you don't already know them, and they're going to be major leaders on these issues. I want to, for the, because uh, 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 the so many people on this call are peace activists, I know there's people from across the board, but all of us care, concerned about peace make note of the fact that Delia Ramirez out of Chicago uh, made peace a major part of her campaign strategy when she won her primary and general election, wrote at length about her moral commitment to assuring that we don't enter wars of whim, that we look at that military budget, that we focus on you know, having a better vision going forward as regards military spending, something that people should really keep pay attention to. Let me close off with one final thing. and. Um, and that is uh, uh, both a, a challenging note and, and perhaps a, a hopeful one, but one that is especially important for organizers. Uh, while we can point to some, you know, relatively, if you're looking at from a partisan standpoint, to relatively positive results for the Democrats uh, nationally and in many of the states, I want to emphasize that Democrats could have done much, much better in 2022. The Democratic Party remains too deferent to corporate money. The Democratic Party also remains too deferent to insider Washington thinking. And I can point to districts across the country where the Democratic insiders, the establishment, pulled money out of campaigns that they could have won or did not provide the resources at the time when those resources were needed. Uh, one example is the Wisconsin U.S. Senate race where Mandela Barnes, a young African-American candidate, the lieutenant governor of the state, genuine progressive backed by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, uh, came within 26,000 votes of winning. I want to emphasize that. Out of millions of votes cast, 26,000 votes. Had he gotten those votes, he would be in the U.S. Senate now, and Democrats would be in a place where, uh, certainly I think the Georgia result is going to be good for Raphael Warnock, Reverend Warnock, but I want to emphasize Democrats could be up two seats in the Senate. That would uh, potentially disempower Cinema and Manchin. And only 26,000 votes was the difference there. A huge amount of money was spent in that race, but in September, uh, the Democrats at the national level did not move sufficient resources to Mandela Barnes, and as a result, he got viciously attacked by a racist ad campaign funded by uh, out-of-state billionaires, and, and the fact is he wasn't able to climb back from that. If Democrats had better strategy, and frankly, a, a better 
connection with uh, progressive candidates, I, I think Mandela Barnes would have won. I can also point to rural districts across the country where rural populists and progressives were running and had a real chance to win. And the Democrats at the Washington level failed to move the money to them. And uh, the result is I can in Western Wisconsin, in my state, uh, it, Brad Pfaff, a, a farm kid from rural Wisconsin, uh, they cut off all of his money. He had no money coming in from the national level or virtually no money. Uh, and yet he got over 48 percent of the vote. He came within a whisker of winning. That's a congressional seat that Democrats could have won if they had simply recognized that you have to have a 50 state strategy and a 3200 or 3300 county strategy where you literally go to the whole country and you have respect for the possibility of winning in rural and outstate areas as well as you know traditional democratic bases. The Democratic Party really radically needs to rethink its approach because the fact of the matter is they could have held the House of Representatives, they could have increased their majority in the Senate more, and frankly they could have done even better in some of the states. Now, um, hindsight's always 2020. And I understand it was a difficult year, but the fact of the matter is that activists, people who are engaged politically, whether it's at a partisan level or a, an issue level, and I wanna emphasize, I understand it's not just electoral politics, but activists really need to pressure uh, for a politics that is universal and that is engaged at every level and in every part of the country, not just in the places that are easy to win. The Democratic Party got really scared in 2022. It ran a cautious and unfocused campaign. Had it run a focused and energetic and offensive campaign, uh, my sense is that, that 2022 could have been uh, a really revolutionary year politically. And one hopes that activists will continue to pressure the party to do better because the fact of the matter is the establishment will never get it right. It's gonna come from the grassroots. It's gonna come from people demanding something better and I'm honored, honored today uh, to be with folks who are, are in that demanding something better camp. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, John. That was a great overview. Uh, so much to digest. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. I will request everyone to put your question in the chat for either Jamie or John, and I will voice the questions to save time. Uh, the first one, Martha Karcher and Judith Atkins write that the non-binding resolution on Medicare for All was supported in 20 districts by big majorities. And Robin Bergman asks, can the health care bill get out of committee? I assume she's talking about the single, single payer bill. My state senator who co-chairs it is now against it, even though she claims she is for it nationally. Before she was leadership, she was for it. I wish Robin would say who that is, but you may know. So you want to comment on that, Jamie? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I, and I should have mentioned, you know, talk about victories in the in the election is that every single uh, district where there was the non-binding referendum on, on health care, as well as the, the Act on Mass uh, Transparency Pledge uh, passed. So that was fantastic. Uh, the Worcester Telegram has a story on that that's that's online uh, that I, I spoke to the reporter about. So I think that's yet another strong sign that the, the public does support, you know, uh, universal health care, single payer, Medicare for all. Um, it is very frustrating, though, is that I, I think it's safe to say that the House and Senate leadership, you know, do not support that. And, you know, I don't know if it's a mix of a sense that it could never happen. There are some that believe that somehow it would harm, you know, the hospital industry, even some that say, what about, you know, <laughs> all the biotech jobs? So it's it's very, it's disheartening some of um, my colleagues' responses. Um, I'll be refiling the Medicare for All bill with Representative Lindsay Sabadosa. Um, we have the Medicare for All caucus. I, I'd, I'd like to think it could get out, out, of, out of committee, um, but I, I think the real question is, you know, unfortunately, that's obviously, as we know, not enough, is that, you know, how do we actually pass the law? And I will say this is an area where, you know, all the groups that are sponsoring today's conference, but also, you know, a lot of the labor unions, including <clears throat> mass nurses and the AFL, is that I, I, I think there needs to be a greater belief that we can get to universal health care. Um, it often isn't prioritized um, by a lot of groups. You know, groups say we endorse this, but 
but how are they going to to fight for it? Um, you know, I mentioned the public higher ed press conference two days ago. That was a really powerful event of getting there, of of you know unions putting their their might and probably their dollars behind that. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement around the Medicare for All movement um, because I do wonder if if the path here is by ballot measure and not the legislature. So that's a quick quick take on on where I see the the in, in the movement. Great, thank you, Jamie. And uh, <clears throat> so Sonny Robinson says, war plus weapons plus sanctions plus climate change equals forced migration, meaning we need strategies that address these interlocking disasters. Uh, I'll let either one of you take that or both of you. Well, I'll take a shot up front. Uh, look, this is one of the great challenges in the United States. We don't have a, uh, a synchronized politics. We don't have an intersectional politics, we tend to treat too many issues as uh, individual tracks and say, you know, boy, we got to deal with this um, or we got to deal with that. And we're right. We do have to deal with all these things. But the fact is that they do interrelate and intermingle. And I really want to emphasize that the climate crisis is now really rapidly and radically intermingling with uh, the military industrial crisis. And what we're seeing is that as the Arctic melts, um, that that is becoming a, a big focus for shipping patterns, right? That, that countries around the world are looking at the Arctic and saying, boy, we can move products, corporations, saying we can move products across the Arctic much more easily now because so much of it is melted. And so uh, as a result, when you have shipping channels, then you have military that goes with it. And the militarization of the Arctic right now is, uh, I would argue, one of the, the, the biggest issues facing the world. Uh, and it is virtually undiscussed at, at almost every level. I know you're going to have some good people speaking later who may reference this, but I cannot emphasize to you that, that we need to start to see the absolute connection between climate change and the growth of the military industrial complex in, in our country, and also that intersection with corporate power. Now, how do we get to that? How do we get to that place? Well, the fact of the matter is that you have to have political figures who speak about it as in a universal form. That is not what the Democratic Party is doing right now. Some Democrats do. Jamie's great. You know, if I, if I could if I could clone Jamie, although I'm not sure I believe in cloning, but uh, but if I could get more, I'd be thrilled. Um, but this is a really vital thing to, to emphasize that activists need to demand a much more uh, intersectional approach. That's obviously intersectional on issues of race, gender, you know, all, all the concerns historically associated with in intersectionality with Kim Crenshaw and others. But it is also, I would argue, expanding out using that wonderful word and, and saying, you know, look, uh, we need to see the intersections between uh, war and peace, climate crisis, corporate power. And the only way we're going to get to that is having high profile political candidates, not just activists, but candidates and political figures speaking to it in a clear and coherent way. And I'll close off by saying you in Massachusetts now have somebody in leadership of the House of Representatives, Representative Clark, who's moved up to a very key position. In fact, frankly, even on a track where one day she might be Speaker of the House. And, uh, and this is a time for activists to say to someone that you know, and who's actually been quite good on a lot of issues over the years, we really want you to be that person. We want you to be the person who sees those connections and talks about them. Uh, I can promise you, if you don't make that noise, it'll be much less likely that she ever does. It's much less likely that anyone ever does. If you do make that noise and if you build that out in smart, strong ways, the way Kathleen was talking about going to, to her representative down in Virginia, um, I, I think that, that this is critical power for Massachusetts. You've got someone in leadership, make sure that that person in leadership uh, uses their position to speak in the most effective ways about these fundamental issues. Got it. Thank you. Um, let's see. Di Diane Foster I got up early in Bellingham, Washington. Oh, my God. She writes, our, our local Dems supported Jason Call against Warmonger Rick Larson, and we worked our butts off for him, but the National Dems and even our revolution let him drop. 
he was a genius candidate and would have put another progressives besides Jayapal in our Washington delegation. Uh, John, you want to sure. comment on that? Now, quickly, and I know Jamie may, Jamie just addressed some of these issues. The primaries are, are where the action is, right? Um, for progressives. Uh, look, I wrote a book a couple of years ago. In fact, Russell Friedman helped me write it. Um, uh, and titled the, the fight for the soul of the Democratic Party. And my argument is that the Democratic Party has had an 80 year struggle now uh, for its direction. And again and again, uh, economic and political elites uh, have won in that struggle. They have prevented progressives from you know really getting to positions of power. Sometimes they'll get close. Sometimes they may cross the line. But overall, the Democratic Party needs to become a more progressive party. That is not a complex concept. I think everybody on this call would agree with it. But the place to do it is going to be in primaries. And the interesting thing about primaries is that, that people have to figure out how to get the strongest, best candidate and move that candidate forward. Um, I won't begin to wade into every primary race to tell you who's good, who's bad, and stuff like that. People on the ground can figure it out based on, on uh, the realities. But I noticed, and I'll just throw it in because I noticed that there was another question about Summer Lee's primary. Uh, out in, in Pennsylvania. And Summer Lee, very progressive state legislator, somewhat associated with Bernie Sanders and others. Uh, she was uh, she was likely to win that nomination. And then you had millions of dollars come in uh, from APAC and other groups, the corporate money uh, coming in to try and defeat her. And what we're seeing around the country is that that's happening. Donna Edwards, who should have gotten back to Congress, got beat in her primary uh, with a huge amount of outside money, again, quite a bit of APAC money. Um, other candidates, uh, Bitcoin money was flying around in primaries around, around the country, uh, all sorts of corporate money going into Democratic primaries. This is something that, that power, economic power, political power has figured out, that you can go into primaries, beat the progressives there, and then keep the Democratic Party on a centrist track. For activists, and that's groups like PDA and others, They've got to, you know, this is this is mission critical, and there's got to be a much deeper focus on primaries. Jamie brought up this idea of creating a table, if you will, you know, getting all the groups together so that they can focus on key primaries, get the energy, resources, uh, even people there to help. Uh, I think that's that's something that needs to happen at the federal level. And I want to emphasize, we are coming on very quickly to the anniversary of the 1974 elections, 50th anniversary, 1974 election cycle. That was the election cycle that brought the biggest wave of progressives into Congress in modern history of the country. It was the Nixon Watergate election. And what happened in those days, in the late 60s, early 70s, was that you had young activists who would literally go from district to district, knock doors. You know, this is part, primarily rooted in the anti-Vietnam War movement, but it was an understanding that the primaries were critical and they won a lot of primaries and they got a lot of people into Congress. The fact of the matter is, I think that Jamie's right, that other people have spoken are right. The overwhelming majority of Americans are for economic and social and racial justice, for saving the planet and for peace. The polls tell us that. But the only way you're going to get that is to go into the primaries and make sure that at least one of the parties, the Democratic Party, uh, which is flawed in so many ways, but at least one of the parties will actually begin to raise those issues at a more fundamental level. And I cannot emphasize to you, Primary fo focus on the primaries is perhaps the most critical thing for activists at this point. Yeah, that's very important. Um, we have the chair of Mass Alliance uh, this afternoon, Jordan Berg Powers. That's a table here that works on state legislature primaries and training candidates and developing candidates, bringing yeah. a lot of progressive groups together, and they've been very successful. But they don't tackle constitutional officers nor Congress. So there is no table in Massachusetts that tackles at that level uh, that I know of. Uh, so that's, so, um, okay. Um, I'm getting more questions for the national level than I am for the state level. And this is frustrating me because we want to tackle both levels. The state you know, Jamie, is, Jamie's capable of answering <laughs> national level questions as well. Well, you're right about that. That's true. Yeah. Not as well as you, John, but thank you. Oh, you are very good. <laughs> All right. Maybe I'll ask a national question and, and tell Jamie to answer it. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> how do we, again, from Robin Bergman, how do we 
counter, what do we do to counter the APAC money and meddling against progressive candidates? John already alluded to some of this, but how, uh, Jamie, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, a APAC, which is obviously mostly, uh, well, who knows, maybe it's changed a little bit, but mostly focused on, on national races. I've certainly read about it in, you know, of course, The Nation and other um, magazines. Um, you know, I, I guess if I can pivot a little bit to, to the state races is, uh, and I mentioned earlier is, and it, it's certainly awkward for, for progressives. And as, as many people know, I was, you know, clean elections candidates. I was elected with, with public financing um, that was repealed, you know, literally a year after I was elected by <laughs> the democratic legislature and governor Romney. Um, so I, I do think, you know, we need to recognize that, you know, as far as grassroots campaigns and and because of the power of, you know, internet and, and you know, uh, sites like Act Blue, it's it's incredibly powerful, you know, it's, it's incredibly powerful ability to raise money low, with low dollar donors. And you know, we saw that with Bert Anders and other races. So I, I think it's I think it's a recognition that if we're if we want to make sure to get progressives elected, um, we we do need to um, you know as I mentioned this this table of you know prioritizing races, but also to to, to raise the money and and I'll give a specific example where there, this was had a, a successful result is that the the Worcester uh, there was a Worcester open Senate seat Senator Harley Chandler retired and you know two two good Democrats the mayor of Worcester who's done a number of good things but I I think it's also fair to say wasn't really that strong on on certain progressive issues and a sort of insurgent uh candidate Robin Kennedy who who really was stronger on a number of progressive issues and uh, I was not involved in the race but uh, I think it's fair to say that you know people were assuming that the mayor of Worcester you know had had the base the machine if you will to win but Robin Kennedy won and that's really going to help in the Senate um, part of the reason way she 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 won is that there was an independent expenditure uh, created, you know, basically by progressives to highlight some of these issues where there was a difference, and that was key uh, to Robin Kennedy winning. So, um, do I love seeing uh, you know lots of money in elections spent? No, it's it's not great, but if it's going to have an impact. Um, I, I do think, you know, targeting where that money is spent. And so I, I think that progressives really need to think about that because we saw, you know, for example, in the lieutenant governor's race where there was, you know, essentially a, a, a corporate PAC, you know, set up to support uh, Mayor Kim Driscoll. And, you know, I think she's great on a lot of issues, but, you know, there's no denying that it was more of a corporate PAC and that did help her significantly. So, um, so I think these are the things we need to think about, um, including for state legislative races and Massachusetts races in general. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I'm going to pick the last question um, because I think it's a very important one from Melissa Brown. Um, Jamie, how can we make the Massachusetts legislature more transparent? She moved here from out of state and was appalled mm -hmm. to learn that she can't just go online and find out how her legislators vote for every single vote. The machine bias trickles down to the city level as well. Can you update us on the whole campaign for transparency and what mm -hmm. the problems are there? Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I mentioned earlier, so in addition to mass care, having these non-binding referenda on single payer, act on mass, um, which has done some fantastic work, you know, also had those. And, and they all passed. So, so, you know, that is once again, a message for more transparency. I'd be the first to say the Massachusetts legislature is one of the least transparent legislatures in the entire country. Um, very frustrating. Um, you know, I've fought in the Senate to, to get those roll call votes to be made public. So we've made some progress in the Senate, but there'll be a rules debate in the, in the new year. And I, and I always say on, on referenda is that, it's not enough just for a referenda to move um, legislators. There needs to be the follow-up. There needs to be the follow-up meetings to say, you know, um, look, uh, we might not get everything that that those of us who are progressive want on transparency, but can we get a couple more, 
changes to the rules, a couple, couple more commitments to make committee votes public. Um, and so I think that follow-up is really necessary now to see where legislators are at, um, because I do think this is an issue that if it was if it was framed correctly, could be very powerful in future races. And now that this transparency effort has been going for about, you know, I'd say six years, I do think there's more resonance among not just Democrats or progressives, but voters in general. But that follow-up, I think, is really critical now as we look ahead to the rules debate, which will probably happen in February. In February, Jamie? Okay, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you uh, to John and Jamie. That was, that was an outstanding overview of a number of political challenges and opportunities we face. And uh, our work is cut out for us, but it's important to know the, the lay of the land and, and set some priorities. So I want to thank both of you for breaking it down for us this morning. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having having us. And, and also thanks for organizing this call and, and for others who are involved. This is really vital and it inspires me as I as I go forward writing about politics to know that you've got this many people who are deeply engaged on, on the fundamental fight for economic and social and racial justice, as well as peace and saving the planet. Yeah, and this is the third time I think you've joined us for this, John, and the second you have, Jamie. And uh, so this has definitely become an annual event. And the, actually the groups that have worked on these over the year have come together, as I mentioned earlier, to form an ongoing organization. We meet every Friday, we talk about all kinds of stuff, and we not only organize conferences, but try to do other stuff. So we're we're gradually getting getting more unity. We still have a ways to go. Thank you both. I'm going to turn it over to Hayat Imam, who's going to moderate the next panel. Uh, she is a board member of Mass Peace Action and active with Dorchester People for Peace. Here comes Hayat. Hey, good morning, everyone. That was such a wonderful, powerful, and thought provoking session. So I welcome you all on my behalf now for joining us together to chart uh, a path now towards our progressive vision. Our first panel now uh, is of distinguished speakers who will address militarism and how the ideology of militarism has, as uh, Cole mentioned, impacted every aspect of US society. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is all on our minds and has undoubtedly made this task far more complex, but also more urgent. The Ukraine war has not only greatly strengthened NATO, it has also expanded militarist ideology. Uh, we are now seeing how differences in the ways that we address this war has set off some divisions in the peace and social justice movements. But difficult as these circumstances are, as peace activists, we're still called upon to address mm -hmm. how the buildup of military resources drains the public treasury and also interferes with democratic and our ability to create joint responses to the problems that we are facing. So all of these are particularly critical today as we face the threat of a nuclear war. So we look forward really today to hearing and learning from our panelists on this uh, very important issue of militarism. Um, I'd like to introduce each speaker separately before they speak. And time is allotted uh, to each speaker uh, is about 12 minutes. And we have planned time at the end for questions and answers. So, our first speaker is Phyllis Bennis. Hello, Phyllis. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, she directs the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, focusing on the Middle East and US wars. She is one of the founders of the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights and now serves on the National Board of Jewish Voice for Peace. Phyllis has served as an informal advisor to top UN officials on Middle East issues, and was shortlisted to become the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territory. She speaks widely across the US and the world and is the writer and editor of 11 published works. Her book, Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict has just been released in its seventh edition. She's also the author of Before and After, US Foreign Policy and the War on Terror and Challenging Empire, how people, governments, and the UN 
def defy US power. Phyllis, you are an important voice for all of us. She has already spoken at two of our previous conferences in this series, once in 2014 and in 2018. Phyllis, it is really a pleasure and an honor to welcome you back today. Go ahead. Well, thanks very much, Hayat, and thanks to you and Cole and all the other organizers and the other organi the sponsoring organizations and all these activists, incredible activists across Massachusetts working on not only stopping wars and militarism, but all of the related issues. Uh, it's so important that we're meeting together for these kinds of discussions, so I'm really delighted to be with you. Sorry it's not in person, but We've all learned a lot about how to do stuff not in person, I suppose. We're looking at a war, at a world right now that is very much mobilized for war. Uh, the, the, there's full-scale war, of course, waging in, in Ukraine and Russia, in Yemen, which we hear much less about. The ceasefire is barely holding in Yemen. Uh, but huge military conflicts that are killing hundreds and thousands of people around the world, whether they are civil or internal, conflicts or wars, insurgencies, drug wars, the leftover wars of the global war on terror, which never ended even as we move into a new stage of potential wars between uh, uh, major powers, but wars that are continuing to go on in, in Myanmar, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Mali, and Ethiopia, and in Colombia, and Congo, and Sudan, and South Sudan, in Mexico, in, in so many countries around the world along with the threats that are escalating of, of extraordinary wars that could erupt between the US and China, between the US and, and NATO with against Russia. All of these wars themselves cause, besides the destruction that they cause themselves, they cause broad scale poverty, they cause environmental catastrophe, they cause refugee crises, they cause authoritarianism to rise. And in almost all of these wars, you see a massive amount of US, war, US arms present. Sometimes you see US troops, much more rare these days than it used to be, thankfully. Uh, and sometimes you see US bombers, but you almost always see US arms, often on both sides of these internal conflicts. And of course, war is not the only cause of these, these massive crises that are erupting in the US and around the world. Uh, poverty itself causes massive refugee crises. The in, environmental catastrophe causes refugee crises. Inequality causes authoritarianism. So it's not always just about war, but militarism is central to all of these catastrophic developments. Certainly we know that the, the the Pentagon is the biggest polluter in, in, of it, all the institutions in the world, that military spending causes poverty, that the military itself foments racism. So we need to understand that role historically, that militarism has been a key component, not a sideline, of US history from its founding as a settler colony on this land. In It was necessary to have better militarization to commit genocide against the indigenous people of this land. It was necessary to have powerful militarized police forces to maintain a slave-based economy in this country. So we need a movement that challenges militarism as well as the military, that challenges war and militarism. And it's partly about having a movement focused on that issue the peace movement, the anti-war movement, the anti-empire movement, whatever we want to call it. But it's crucial that we have a strong movement that defines itself in that way, but also that we understand that part of our role is to get that information about militarism to all the other social movements that are on the rise, whether they are fighting against racism, fighting against misogyny, fighting for immigrant rights, for trans rights, fighting for the climate. All of these movements desperately need this information to use in their own strategies because of this powerful uh, connection. I think we're, you're gonna hear soon from, from my friend and IPS colleague, Lindsay Koshgarian, uh, about the costs of militarization at home, the economic and social and environmental costs. I think what, what John raised earlier about the militarization of the Arctic as one example of the dangers of this, the militarization of Europe as a 
region in the wake of the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine is a key component of it. And something that occurred to me yesterday at the, the fire, di- fire Drill Friday protests, which are back in, in person in Washington with Jane Fonda leading an incredible mobilization to keep the focus on climate in general, but specifically right now on stopping mansions and others dirty deal, uh, which I won't go into all the details of it. I think people are, are more or less familiar with what that would mean. And one of the parts of that discussion is understanding that part of the strategy of people in Congress, Democrats as well as Republicans, is to get this thing passed by including it in what's considered a must pass uh, resolution that will be voted on uh, during this next next four weeks of the uh, of, of this last period of this Congress. And what we're talking about there is the NDAA, the defense budget. And that by including the dirty deal in the defense budget, the theory goes, they would have to pass it. Now there's a lot of opposition to it, so it may not happen. But very few people are talking about the very notion of defining the military budget, which this year is gonna go up to somewhere around $850 billion. Just imagine that, $850 billion for one year, just one year. That's over half the entire discretionary budget. And to say that that's the must pass resolution that you can guarantee something terrible will be passed because we have to pass that. When did that become a must pass anything? You know, so we have to keep our eye on this broad question of what does it mean to be looking at the military spending of this country? Military money fuels a militarized economy across the board. My friend, Laura Flanders, who, who did an, an extraordinary uh, uh, television show, she, she does the Laura Flanders show, on some of what's going on in North Carolina, but I think is probably far more prevalent around the country, perhaps including in Massachusetts, than any of us are necessarily aware of all the time, the establishment of private training camps designed, as she puts it, to privatize the military and militarize the public resources, uh, but to build these extraordinary private training camps to train often military veterans to become police officers and ultimately to provide training for racist thugs involved in the white supremacy movement in this country without oversight in often small towns with majority brown and black populations based on the assumption that nobody will really pay attention if they bring in a little bit of investment to the local community. Nobody will bother looking at what they actually are doing. They're assuming that. And this becomes the centerpiece of where white supremacists are getting their military training. So wars are creating this phenomenon of of veterans who can't get jobs except by going into police work or military training. And it's a very, very dangerous process of the overall militarization of, of of our country. Right now, the war in Ukraine is very much at the military uh, the military item that's at the center of our discussion in this country and, and globally as well, partly for in this country, because of racism, we need to be clear about that, that these are mainly white Europeans. We saw a real distinction with the African and Asian students and others who were working and studying in Ukraine who were not welcomed the way native Ukrainians who are white people, white Europeans who were welcomed as they should be at the borders with hot soup and toys for the children and warm clothes and a guarantee of a home for at least two years until they could go back to their own homes. That's how every refugee in the world should be welcomed. But we know that not all of them are. The Palestinians are not, the Afghans are not, the Iraqis are not, the Somalis are not. And that's part of our struggle to support the right of all refugees using the example we now have, that we now know it's possible to welcome refugees the way they should be welcomed based on how most of the refugees from Ukraine have been welcomed. But we also see in the context of of the war in Ukraine that Europe, which as an aspiration, the, the project of creating a unified Europe was talked about from the beginning as a project of human rights. Now, that's not even on the agenda as an aspiration. It was never a reality, but it was an aspirational idea and that was a good one. But now that's not even being talked about. 
Now it's Europe as a military power in its own right, so that there will be more than 2% of every country's GDP put into the military. Countries like Germany that since World War II were reluctant for all the right reasons to export arms are suddenly jumping over each other to send more arms to Ukraine and putting 100 billion euros into their military just this year. You know, this is the, uh, even before we get to the expansion of NATO, these are the, the, the consequences of the war in Ukraine. We need to understand that US diplomacy must go forward and the, at the legal level, that means for our government, what we demand of our government, they should be talking among other things about the diplomacy that's needed between the US and Russia, even aside from the question of the war in Ukraine, where of course Ukrainians must play the, the dominant role in any diplomacy that goes forward. But the US has a number of items it has to negotiate with Russia that's separate from that. Re going back to all of the abandoned nuclear weapons agreements that are so desperately needed at this time of nuclear escalation in Ukraine and, and elsewhere. The US base in Poland, less than 100 miles from the Russian border. That's something that the US and Russia need to be talking about. Clarifying that US sanctions against Russia will in fact be lifted when there's a ceasefire in place. So all of that is crucial. All of that has to go on between the US and Russia. Can't wait for the final negotiations that are so desperately urgently needed that involve Ukraine and Russia as well. So what, when we talk about taking on the military industrial complex, stopping the war profiteering, these are all the demands that we have to make on our government. We need a diplomatic strategy as well for the peace movement, which will go far beyond what we demand day to day of our government. Not only stopping the war profiteering, but stopping NATO. We need diplomacy, not war, in every example for, of, of all of these wars. We need to support all the refugees, not only Ukrainian refugees. And we know that we need a much broader movement mobilization that is capable of doing that. We need to be able to cut the military budget to fund healthcare and education and childcare and elder care and jobs and the climate, all of these things. We need to expose the racism and Islamophobia and xenophobia that is inherent in US military actions around the world and within the US military. You know, one example is the, the Poor People's Campaign when they speak of the intersecting mm -hmm. in, injustices mm -hmm. uh, of, of, uh, uh, that go on in this country. That means Martin Luther King's three evils uh, of racism, poverty, and militarism plus climate. And I will end so that we, I'm hoping we have a lot of time to discuss this. I will end with one example of something as simple as the, the child tax credit, you know, which was increased massively in the context of COVID. And one of the, the biggest crimes of our society was that we have child poverty at such a huge rate. And that new child tax credit escalation cut child poverty in half in the first year of the pandemic. And now that COVID is considered pretty much over, the emergency is over, the tax credit expansion is, is cut, it's over, it's done, and child poverty is skyrocketing again. Martin Luther King, who told us that, he's, that we need to see war as an enemy of the poor and attack it as such, Dr. King would tell us that the military budget has something to do with why we are now cutting the child tax credit and sending millions millions of children back into poverty. We have to learn and to teach those lessons again, again and again. That's how we build a movement that can challenge this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Um, I, think, I think what you said is that we have to remember things that we used to do and still keep doing them. So for example, I um, am so struck by what you said about all these wars all around the world and to find US arms on both sides sometimes is just a chilling kind of a fact that we have to remember. Also, you've um, offered us as a strategy that the importance of, it's terrible to have to do that, but the importance of attaching what we need to the NDAA bill, because that has become the must pass bill now which is kind of a shameful thing, but that, that's the reality. 
Um, yes, thank you so much. And I do think that many of the things that you've said, specifically how we need to uh, take the issue of militarism to all the movements that are going on, you know, to show the links to all the social justice movements, because they are all linked. And I think we all know that, but when it comes to actually creating actions and plans, we need to remember that that is a point of focus for all of us. So thank you, Phyllis. We do have time at the end to speak. I would now like to um, introduce our next speaker for this panel, um, TJ Jackson Lears. Uh, tell me, uh, do you go by TJ or TJ Jackson? No, I just go by Jackson. You can Jackson. drop the Okay, here. great. <laughs> All right. I don't know how um, ended up Jackson there. is on the is the board of governors professor of history at Rutgers University and the editor of the distinguished journal Raritan, a quarterly review. Uh, Jackson's research interests include US cultural and intellectual history, comparative religion, the visual arts, and folklore. Honestly, uh, Jackson, I thought this was such a wonderful collection of different things to be interested in. Very, very rounded out. Um, Jackson has been awarded fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and both the Rockefeller and Guggenheim Foundations. He is a historian's historian and Cornell West has called him one of the preeminent historians of our time. His books include Fables of Abundance, A Cultural History of Advertising in America, which I believe won the LA Times Book Prize for History, and also uh, Rebirth of a Nation, The Making of Modern America, 1877 to 1920. In this book, published in 2009, Jackson reviews the half century between the Civil War and World War I, which he believes formed the foundation for the modern US. Those years of marked social conflict and wrenching political discord provide a lens for our times, I think. So thank you for being here to share your very unique perspective with us. Uh, go ahead, Jackson. Uh, you're very welcome, Haya. Thank you uh, for that uh, introduction. And, and uh, uh, thanks to Martha for in inviting me and for, for all of you uh, for uh, daring to raise the question of militarism uh, in the midst of one of the most heavily propagandized moments uh, in our history, I think. Uh, I'm honored as well to be uh, on the same panel with Phyllis Bennis, uh, whose piece in, in these times I read the day after uh, the Russian invasion. Um, and I was so moved by her sanity uh, in the midst of, of all of the war fever uh, that still grips uh, so much of the punditocracy, at least, whether it grips the population as a whole is another question. I was so moved that I did something I rarely do, and that is I actually went on to my Twitter account and tweeted it. Uh, I try to avoid social media as much as possible, but I couldn't resist in this case. My millions of followers, I'm sure, appreciated that. Uh, but uh, thank you, Phyllis, for that and for your your voice since then, which I've been paying attention to every chance I get. I want to take a brief minute to indulge myself in telling my own <clears throat> story here, uh, which is which is a story of an ancient mariner uh, in uh, in 1969 and 1970. Uh, I was a Navy cryptographer. Uh, with a top secret clearance on a ship that carried nuclear weapons, which the Navy denied, by the way. My job, among others, was to decrypt the message that would have launched those non-existent weapons. Uh, and this caused me to think quite hard about my role in the military. I had been opposed uh, to the Vietnam War when I was in college, but like other young men of my class and conservative cultural background. I could imagine no real alternative to military service, so I did what a lot of other young men did, which was to join Naval ROTC in college. And I ended up, uh, due to my assignment, uh, finding myself in the same ethical dilemma, at least potentially, uh, that I would have faced on the ground in Vietnam. In fact, there was no way I could do my job in the Navy uh, without killing civilians. That's the nature of nuclear weapons. 
despite all the talk then and more recently of the surgical precision with which uh, so many of them can be uh, allegedly outfitted. So there I was tossing on my bunk, uh, even considering uh, deserting uh, to Canada. Uh, fortunately, through a friend, uh, I discovered a group called Pacific Coast uh, Military Counseling, and I learned uh, I could apply for conscientious objector discharge if I could show that my beliefs had changed after going on active duty. And this, in fact, I could do. My assignment crystallized my doubts uh, into anti-war convictions, not just about the Vietnam War, but about all modern wars, all of which kill civilians systematically and unavoidably. To make a long story short, uh, I was honorably discharged as a conscientious objector. Now, my lessons for contemporary uh, affairs in this story are, are three. Uh, the first of them is the role of class uh, in the military as, every, as everywhere else in our society, because a young man, a very young man, even younger than I was, uh, named Jacobs from Kansas, I only knew him as RM2 Jacobs, he applied for, uh, he, he was in my uh, department, the communications department on this US Navy cruiser. His name was Jacobs, as I say. Uh, and he was a 19 year old kid uh, without a whole lot of education. Uh, he applied for a conscientious objector discharge at the same time I did. And he was thwarted at every step of the way. I was an officer uh, and uh, he was the lowest of the low enlisted recruits. And uh, he, he was he was he was baited he was harassed uh his, his requests were ignored uh, and ultimately he deserted and eventually uh was picked up by the fbi in canada uh he was as sincere every bit as sincere as i was and as every bit as deserving uh of an honorable discharge uh but he came nowhere near receiving it because of the place that he came from uh in our society uh, and the place he occupied in the military uh, bureaucratic hierarchy. So that's one lesson. The second is uh, remembering to, the importance of remembering the source of the disinformation in the story. And this, bear in mind, is over 50 years ago, so this is not new. It's been going on for a long time, right down to the present. The source was the military itself, along with the national security state. Uh, and, and we have to remember when we talk about the problem of disinformation in this society, which pervades a lot of the punditocracy, uh, even as we speak, uh, the source of disinformation, the original and professional source is the national security state. And it still is, even at this time when we now have retired CIA directors posing as professional wise men on allegedly liberal news media channels. This is a scandal. This is a scandal that these people who have perjured themselves before Congress uh, should be accorded this role. But that's the society we live in. And I'm going to circle back around to that uh, before I conclude. So that's the second point is a source of disinformation. It's just not just a bunch of QAnon right wing wackos. Uh, admittedly, they're a menace and they're dangerous and we have to discredit them. Uh, but they're very easy to discredit by comparison. Uh, to the national security state with all of its power and all of its legitimacy. Uh, and this is what we have to re-remember somehow uh, as, we, uh, as we go forward, uh, is, is where the real source of disinformation lies uh, and the most powerful and moneyed source of disinformation. And finally, the third lesson from my experience that I want to bring up here now is uh, the, uh, the importance of a kind of communist, common, common militarist me uh, mentality uh, outside uh, the military as well as inside it. And it involves a, a denatured language of objectivity. Uh, it involves a reduction of human beings to numbers. Uh, I remember reading Theodore Razak's book, The Making of a Counterculture, about what he called the myth of the objective consciousness while I was tossing on my bunk worrying about my role in causing at least potentially a nuclear war. So what I want to say here when I talk about this common militarist mentality, this is one reason I became a cultural historian is I wanted to dissect this mentality and, and demonstrate its, its destructive capacities. Uh, 
but there are links between the local counterinsurgency conflicts in uh, in Vietnam, uh, like like the one I was cutting my intellectual teeth on, uh, and it, you can pick your dozens of others ever since. Links between those local conflicts and the big picture of nuclear war and the nuclear arms race. Uh, they involve the same kind of mentality. They depend on the same kind of mentality, the distancing from human suffering and violence and pain. And uh, so in, in the decades since uh, my discharge from the Navy, I've been teaching and writing uh, much of the time against the militarist foreign policy, or at least attempting to discover uh, the historical roots of that foreign policy. And, and some of this uh, agitation that I was involved in, I was involved in the uh, peace studies program at the University of Missouri, which was my first teaching job out of graduate school. Uh, I was involved in the nuclear freeze movement that seemed to be an apparent success, at least uh, briefly and for a moment, it held out the prospect, the actual abolition of nuclear weapons until uh, Reagan realized he couldn't give up his, his Star Wars fantasy uh, of uh, creating the so-called nuclear shield, which was a boondoggle and a fantasy and still is. Uh, so the, the nuclear freeze movement never realized its full possibility, but what it did do was show the critical importance of citizen diplomacy outside the typical channels of official diplomacy, because what people tend to forget is that there was a huge uh, anti-nuclear movement, a nuclear freeze movement in, this, in effect, in the Soviet Union too. And that was part of the background of Gorbachev's uh, rise to power. More commonly though, uh, despite that moment of apparent victory, uh, we in the peace movement faced endless frustration. The massive worldwide protest against the first Gulf War and the invasion of Iraq 12 years later uh, had no impact ultimately on foreign policy. Uh, or even ultimately on the national conversation. Uh, the people uh, who were dead wrong about those wars uh, kept their legitimacy. The people who were spot on about those wars continued uh, to be outsiders. Now, the general drift of policy since then has been toward bipartisan consensus in military intervention abroad. The collapse of the USSR, the end of the Cold War, the vision of a unipolar world is what that brought with the US, of course, on top, not a peace dividend, which was briefly spoken of. Oh, well, the Cold War is over. We might actually have some money to address all of these urgent social matters, problems that people have been alluding to all along and other speakers already uh, in our uh, domestic policy. Uh, no, we couldn't do that. Instead, we had continued agitation for a permanent war economy, which uh, was again, uh, a popular point of view in both political parties. And uh, I think we know why, but we can unpack that at a, a greater length. The Republicans who started to call themselves neoconservatives, though there was nothing conservative about them, nothing they wanted to conserve, but they were for expansion of US power pretty much for its own sake and the restoration of what they called a new American century. The Democrats had the, basically the same militarist, expansionist, imperial policies, but tarted up with universalist humanitarian rhetoric about global leadership, leadership uh, about a rules-based international order, uh, which always begged the question, i.e. ignored the question of who made rules. Uh, and this part of the consequence of this was the beginnings, even in the early 90s of the expansion of NATO uh, eastward, uh, which did in fact take uh, cr create uh, Russian security concerns, which Kennan, George Kennan, and other major uh, figures in our diplomatic and, and political history warned against. And uh, we are living with the consequences of ignoring those warnings uh, right now in the midst of this uh, war in Ukraine. So it's not surprising that. Uh, the, the, the major renewed commitment to the modernization of our nuclear arsenal was made by Obama, not by the Republicans. Even though the Republicans supported it and Trump continued it, 
uh, Obama was the initiator of it, and that was perfectly in keeping uh, with the mood of the, Dem the Democratic Party leadership uh, since the Clinton era, basically, since the 1990s. Uh, so the consequence, the nuclear arms race, nuclear arms race was restarted again, reaccelerated. Uh, and since the rise of Trump uh, in 2016, uh, peace has virtually disappeared from the progressive agenda. Uh, it's been replaced by a focus on the rights of ethnic, racial, and sexual minorities, uh, on the protection of immigrants, and on climate change. And believe me when I say to you, I think these are all worthy and, and quite urgent causes in their own right. But what most progressives, at least at the national level, uh, don't seem to realize is that all of them, all of those causes, and you've, my companions here have already been saying these things, uh, all of these are threatened by our militarist foreign policy, whether it involves toppling foreign dictators without regard for the consequences, as in the case of Gaddafi and Libya and the subsequent unleashing of mountains of weapons throughout North Africa and the Middle East, uh, whether it's fighting a proxy war against Russia to the last Ukrainian, or most important, whether it's restarting the nuclear arms race and enlarging an already bloated, hugely bloated military budget. Now, the recent history of progressive foreign policy, I have to say, is a history of failure and silence. The silence is particularly striking among traditional peace groups. And here I exempt, by the way, one of which I'm a member, and I know there are other members here present, uh, Veterans for Peace. Uh, this is not an indictment against that group, but against, for example, I can think of many others, but let me just give you the most egregious example, the American Friends Service Committee, which was hugely helpful to me when I was in the Navy and to many other uh, military conscious objectors back in the late 60s and early 70s. Now you can go to the AFSC website and see lots of attention paid to mass incarceration, uh, to immigration policy, to a whole range, uh, to climate change even, uh, but nothing, not a word uh, about the urgency of a ceasefire and a negotiated settlement in, Ukra in Ukraine. So this is simply astounding to me. Uh, so the silence of peace groups is part of the problem, but the failure is also quite egregious in many cases. And look, you know, political leaders, uh, Bernie Sanders being a prime example with his, uh, uh, his kind of uh, alarming uh, swerve toward support for a militarist and imperialist foreign policy, uh, which he seems to think is still consistent with, with a progressive domestic policy. The point of this gathering, as I read it, and it's certainly my point too, is that it, no, it's not consistent with a progressive domestic policy. Uh, but progressive caucus, so-called, uh, failed utterly to stand by a tepid call for diplomacy, a tepid call for diplomacy, the 30 progressives signed. They backed away immediately when the howls of the punditocracy and the democratic leadership began to be heard. So what is to be done? Every, everybody's favorite question, right? Uh, easier posed than answered. But the, but the quick answer, and, and here I'm just you know, reasserting what Phyllis said, I think quite eloquently, is link domestic and foreign policy. Hammer away at the destructive impact of militarism. And I'm going to give four different examples and then I'll stop. The first destructive impact of militarism is obvious, but again, largely unmentioned these days. And that's draining money away huge amounts of it from resources that are desperately needed by marginalized outgroups and indeed for all Americans. Medicare for all, for example, is constantly being met by the observation or the repost. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. Right? We can afford 800 billion, 850 billion, I forget, I'm not current, 850 billion for the military policy and Lord knows how much else 
uh, in consulting fees for all those people in Northern Virginia. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is affordable, uh, but Medicare for all is not. So this is a problem we're facing. Every time I take the train through Baltimore between Washington and New York, uh, I'm reminded of the schools in Baltimore and cities like it. No heat, no books. This is a disgrace. This is an absolute disgrace. Yeah. I know those. I know those schools. I taught in one once. This is an old argument, uh, but one which has somehow been forgotten. So I'm saying uh, to all of you and to everyone who's out there actively involved, it's, you can't bring it up enough. It's so important. You know, this imperial foreign policy makes a lot of people very rich, but it also makes even more people very poor. Many more people. Okay, that's number one. The second is the continuing catastrophes that we're creating abroad through our imperial overreach uh, are also creating refugee policy, uh, uh, populations en route to our own shores as well as many uh, elsewhere in Europe. Uh, and they create hardships for those who stay behind. Uh, think of the Middle East after the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, Think of North Africa after the overthrow of Gaddafi. Uh, think of Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba under the impact of economic sanctions. And remember, please, that economic sanctions are a form of violence too. And in fact, they led directly uh, to the rise of Nazism in the early 1920s uh, in Germany. People are starving. Uh, when people are starving, they don't think straight and they listen to voices in the air authoritarian voices, many of them, uh, and they're very seductive sounding because they want answers, they want relief to their suffering. So that's the second thing. There is a connection between immigration and refugee crises, obviously uh, between those crises and our foreign policy. Uh, the third thing, third of four, uh, and, the, and it's getting even more important now, the impossibility of addressing climate change without real international cooperation. Jeffrey Sachs talks about this all the time. He's one of the only people I know who's saying, look, you wanted to address climate change, you cut or reorient your foreign policy. You cannot see climate change as uh, addressing climate change as anything but a hopeless prospect. It will always be a hopeless prospect in a world that is divided into hostile armed camps. And this is the world that the US is playing a major role in creating even as we speak right now. This is not a world that is ever going to come to grips with climate change. Finally, number four, the impossibility of life itself after the ultimate climate change caused by nuclear war, which again, the US confrontations with Russia and China are already helping to make more likely, as well as, of course, the abandonment of all of those nuclear arms treaties uh, and uh, in, in the beginning in the Bush administration and continuing through the Obama and Trump administrations uh, right down to the present. I'm reminded here again, uh, and, and this is a cultural historian in me trying to pay attention uh, to what is out there uh, in terms of uh, public media, public offerings. Uh, the New York City public service ad, which some of you may have undoubtedly seen on Twitter or elsewhere, uh, that deploys all the old cliches uh, about the impact of a nuclear explosion on New York City. Get yourself inside. Don't try to run away in your car. Don't try to hide. Get yourself inside. Close the windows. Get away from the windows. And oh, by the way, if you've been exposed to radiation, take a shower. This is what we used to be told in the Navy. This is what the civil defense fantasies that Robert Shear satirized decades ago, saying with enough shovels, you know, we can win this thing. We can outlast this thing. Nuclear weapons are not weapons like any other. They cannot be used, period. And we have got to revive that belief and that insight. We have forgotten so much in the last 30, 40, 50 years. And we can't begin to work for peace uh, until we start remembering again. 
uh, I'm reminded of the great novelist Milan Kundera's famous statement, and I'll revise it slightly, the struggle of people against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And we have got to do some serious remembering here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Jackson. I am really glad at this moment that we are recording this because you've given us some really specific points that we need to mull over and think again about. A few things struck me very strongly. I'm really so glad that you mentioned that US wars and sanctions have consequences all over the world. I mean, there uh, are so many ways that you've mentioned refugees, you've mentioned the suffering of people, but it also creates the hostility and the disunion in this world when unity is the main thing we need in order to address some of the key issues that we're facing, which is nuclear arms disarmament, um, climate change and so on. Um, but I think one of the things that you said earlier that kind of gave me a chill is the fact that disinformation is, is not just coming from kooks like QAnon. They're coming to us in uh, as if uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, these very uh, wonderful CIA, ex-CIA people, pundits, who are now telling us things that we, we think should be heard. But uh, I mean, that is... Uh, all over the news is that's what we're listening to. Um, and the sad, saddest thing I heard today is that the imperial ambitions of this country are on both sides of the camp. I mean, I wish we could say that, yeah, the Democrats are better than the Republicans on this or vice versa, but um, I think militarism is going to continue so long as that seems to be what is the main thing that's pushing us. So um, I also like that you remembered, uh, speaking of remembering, that we did have some success in the past, you know, that the peace movement did make a difference when it came to the nuclear power issues. We've seen some successes in the past. So I hope that's going to give us the energy to keep going. Thank you very much, Jackson. And I hope there'll be much more time for questions in the end. Um, our third panelist is Lindsay Koshgarian. Lindsay is the program director for the National Priorities Project, or NPP, as we call it, which is a very familiar name for all of us peaceniks. NPP, based in Western Mass, is a project of the Institute for Policy Studies. And how wonderful it must be, Lindsay, to go to work each day knowing the mission of your organization is to inspire individuals and movements to take action so our federal resources prioritize peace, shared prosperity and economic security for all. The work of the NPP is also to develop helpful fact sheets on important topics, for example, no national security without climate security or Biden's uh, FY2023 budget prioritizes war and militarization over critical needs again. So we, all, <coughs> in the peace movement, I think we turn again and again to NPP for our own organizing and we find your work repeatedly of use. And I'm not a bit surprised to know that NPP was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. Lindsay's work is rooted in social justice as she got her start in her professional life as a clinic worker and organizer at Planned Parenthood and led economic development and affordable housing studies at the University of Massachusetts Donahue Institute. She holds a master's in public policy from UCLA and a BA in physics from the University of Pennsylvania. Lindsay's work and commentary on the federal budget and military spending, it can be heard on NPR, on the BBC, on CNN, The Nation, US News and World Report, and many other outlets. And we are intently looking forward, Lindsay, to hearing your analysis firsthand here today. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, sorry about that little pause there. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you to the organizers and to all of you for being here today. Um, and thank you for to Phyllis and Jackson for your really excellent remarks on how and why we need to demilitarize and, and what US militarism looks like today. 
Um, I'm going to talk, of course, about our our budget, our federal budget, and how it enables this militarism and um, and what we can do about that. Um, so we need to demilitarize, um, but we also need to recognize that in our domestic politics here in the U.S., where we have the world's biggest military budget by far, um, and are a source of much of the world's, as Phyllis pointed out, weapons and um, misinformation, as Jackson pointed out, and all the other effects of our militarism. Um, we need to focus on what enables all of that, which is our military budget. Um, and we also need to focus on our domestic politics and the fight that we have in our domestic politics between investing in that military and militarism and between investing in domestic needs, um, which Jackson mentioned as one of his factors, and I'm going to talk about quite a bit more. Um, so in the U.S., we have um, we have escaped austerity politics largely for the last few years during the pandemic, but it's coming back and we're going to hear more calls for cutting budgets um, that is going to put more pressure on uh, the entire budget. But as we've seen time and time again, um, the Pentagon budget tends to be something that escapes a lot of that pressure. Um, over the last 10 years, we also had something called, uh, ending in 2021, we had something called the Budget Control Act, which without going into all of the details, one of the provisions of that act was a, a lock step between military and domestic spending, so that in order to get more domestic spending, there had to be more military spending always. Um, and a lot of that politics, even though the Budget Control Act itself expired in 2021, a lot of that same politics has kind of been locked in place now. Um, and so we're seeing that same dynamic uh, with every year's budget in Congress. Um, so, for example, the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act that the Biden administration championed and that passed Congress, um, those have good amounts of funding for their priorities, but those that funding will expire. Um, but by contrast, even though the Pentagon is funded on a year to year basis, those increases tend not to expire. Those increases tend to persist and be added to year after year. So even though um, it's a, we're supposed to just have a Pentagon budget for one year and these other things are supposed to be time limited, that's not how it works in practice. Um, and what that means, of course, is that Pentagon and military spending tends to just go endlessly up over time, um, and domestic spending does not do that. Um, now, of course, we all know that you know Democratic leadership, at, as Jackson pointed out, they typically haven't taken our side on a lot of these issues, and and some of the reasons for that are familiar. We know they don't want to look soft. Um, we know that they want to make sure that they're seen as um, as equally tough on whatever opponent it may be at the given moment. Um, we know that there are pressures from the industry, which are huge. Um, there are more industry lobbyists for the military industry than there are members of Congress. Um, we know that there is immense pressure to create jobs if, in this industry, all of those things. Um, but there's also what I just referred to, which is this instinct to give away more military spending in order to get more domestic spending. And this is a really real dynamic. This is something that even pulls in progressives in Congress. F folks who otherwise are voting these days are voting no on things like the military budget when it's alone will still agree to pass higher military spending if it's attached to more domestic spending. So that's a problem that we have. Um, and we need to kind of face that as part of our problem um, and, and recognize that, that we need to be explicitly asking uh, for that not to happen, explicitly asking that we aren't going to trade this anymore. Um, so that's, that's kind of the backdrop. And that's especially relevant to the moment where we are right now, um, which is we're in an omnibus budget moment. The, there were the fiscal year 2023 budget has not passed yet. Congress is working on it as we speak. A lot of that is happening behind doors. Um, one thing we just heard this week uh, is that House and Senate leaders have apparently agreed to an $847 billion um, military budget for the coming year. That is a huge amount. It is more than $100 billion higher than when Trump left office. And that doesn't include direct money for the Ukraine war that doesn't include Ukraine money. So you can't blame it on that. 
Um, so that's a huge increase under a Democratic president and over the last couple of years with Democratic control of both the House and Senate. Um, and that's that's kind of what we're facing right now. Um, then you have the fact that there's sort of all of these actors are participating, the Biden administration, the House, the Senate. Um, but the increase that the House and Senate just agreed to over even what Biden requested for the Pentagon this year uh, is $45 billion. That would be enough to enact the child care and preschool parts of the Build Back Better Act that were dropped when Senator Manchin opposed it. Um, and again, this is supposed to be for one year, but we know how this works. When the Pentagon gets an increase, it tends to hang on to it and even add to it. Um, so this is, again, we're being told we can't afford certain things, we can't afford other things. Um, it's also that single year increase is more than twice what it would cost on an annual basis to continue the child tax credit that Phil has referred to that cut child poverty in half. So we're trading away terrible things domestically when we're agreeing to fund the Pentagon at this level. Um, and even though they've just agreed to 847 billion, the whole deal is not done yet, which means it could still go higher. Um, so that's what we're looking at right now. Um, and more than half of the discretionary budget that Congress is working on right now will likely be military. We don't have final numbers on this yet, but this is what happens every year and there's no reason to expect it to be different. Um, so that's more than half goes to the military but U.S. militarism isn't just the Pentagon and nuclear weapons. It's not just the military. It's also militarism inside our borders. Um, and we need to kind of stop thinking of it as completely separate. These are functions that are in separate agencies. And yes, the Pentagon operates outside of the U.S., but so do a lot of our domestic military agencies. You know, we have um, an FBI that operates internationally, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Bureau acts internationally. Um, we have lots of militarized agencies like that that are acting both inside and outside of U.S. borders. And we need to stop differentiating or, or we need to stop believing the differentiation that we're being fed about what's, you know, that we need to look at what's outside of our borders versus inside of our borders. Um, so once you include the full um, what the Biden administration and what is, has been legislatively called security, not just national security, but security. That includes the Pentagon, it includes nuclear weapons, it includes spending on veterans, which even though we may not oppose that spending, the only reason it's necessary at the level it is is because we have so many veterans and we send so many people to war. Um, and then spending in the Department of Homeland Security, which is a military agency. Um, in large part. If you exclude FEMA, most of the Department of Homeland Security is ICE and uh, the border and border control. And those are militarized agencies. The Border Patrol is one of the world's largest police forces. Um, so if you include all of that, then it gets up to fully two thirds of our annual discretionary budget that goes to these things. We have only one in three dollars left for things like childcare or healthcare or education or any of the other priorities that we need. Um, so we're we're just throwing this money away and, and it's not available for anything else, uh, anything else that we need it to do. Um, now, we know, again, ordinary factors that are kind of pushing politically inside of our country for more military spending, you know, there's fear, there's militarism, there's U.S. exceptionalism, there are jobs, all of those are real factors. But right now there are three kind of particularly timely factors that are pushing for higher military spending. One of them is the Ukraine war. And it's important that we not just look at the money that's being directly allocated for the Ukraine war when we look at that, because it's also being used to push the entire Pentagon budget higher, things that explicitly officially have nothing to do with Ukraine are being pushed as well based on the Ukraine war as a justification. Um, so we need to we need to look more broadly when we think about that. Um, and even though we know that you know the US military budget is already 12 times that of Russia. So clearly more spending is not is not the answer even if we did want to go head to head, which we don't. Um, the second reason yeah, is China. 
um, that, well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think many of us want a direct US Russia war in this, on this, on this call. I realize there's, there are various uh, takes on, on what their US role should be. Um, the second reason is, is China. Um, and this has been stoked also by the, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, because they're um, in the Pentagon elite, there is very much focus on the possibility of a China invasion of Taiwan. Um, and so that's another place where that's coming from. And it's also coming from all this economic anxiety about China, right? And cultural and racist anxiety about China that we have in the United States. Um, and the third thing is inflation, um, because the Pentagon argues that it's suffering from inflation just like the rest of us. The truth is that it's not. It's experiencing very different inflation from the rest of us, because as you can imagine, the Pentagon buys very different things from the rest of us. And so they're not experiencing the same inflation. And so far, there's been no sign uh, that inflation is actually impacting the Pentagon in a serious way. And so Therefore, it doesn't need a budget raise based on that. Um, so there are arguments that we can make back against all of these things. Um, but all of this kind of points us to what we need to be doing. Um, one is that we need to be having, because militarism is not just the Pentagon, it's not just the, and the Department of Energy, it's not just these agencies, it's not just outside of our borders. We need to be building stronger ties with anti-militarism movements more broadly. And that includes um, that includes defund ICE and defund the police campaigns, all of these divest campaigns that want us to take money away from militarism and put it into human needs. Um, and we're building those ties. Um, and we were part, of, for example, the summer of a convening between groups across different silos of this sort of um, militarism, you know, including policing, including war and, and peace groups, including immigrant right groups. Um, so we're starting to build those relationships and not just talk about the issues, you know, how the issues are tied, but actually build real flesh and blood or virtual relationships between people in the movements so that we can really work together. And that's work that is crucial and it's work that takes time. Um, so that's, that's something that um, has been happening for the last couple of years and is starting to show some progress. Um, another thing that's been mentioned also is links to the climate movement, um, and not just at, for the U.S. as an emitter of fossil fuels or for the U.S. military as emitter of fossil fuels, but also um, for the crucial point that Jackson made about the fact that we need diplomacy and we need to um, cut back on tensions between especially the U.S. and China, which are the two world's two biggest emitters. There's no solution to climate change unless these two countries both participate fully. Um, so that's another, another place. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention the People Over Pentagon Act, which is uh, a, a piece of legislation from um, Barbara Lee and Mark Pocan um, that has now about 30 co-sponsors. Um, and that's to cut the Pentagon budget by over $100 billion. Um, and it's a terrific organizing tool. It's something, the more co-sponsors we can get, the more people we can get to support it, um, the more we have a base in Congress for actually beginning to get close to where we could cut Pentagon spending for real. Um, and as one example of that, uh, the House voted this summer to revert on whether or not to reverse the amount that the House Armed Services Committee had added um, to the to the Biden Pentagon budget um, and got 150 votes to reverse that increase. Um, so we need to take our win, our things like that, where we have something to build from and really work on building on that piece by piece. Um, and it's slow work and it's painstaking work, um, but we can get, you can see a path from 150 to 218. Um, so that's where we need to be putting a lot of our efforts as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was really, uh, just what I expected that we would really um, have some concrete ideas from you. I love the final thing you said, Barbara Lee's stepping up for us again. I think we should go straight to questions. I'm afraid we are really running a little bit late. Uh, so maybe just a very, I'll ask uh, Paul Shannon to step in and see what we can do with questions right now. 
You're muted, Paul. Yeah. My, uh, my unmuted now. Yeah. Okay, great. And I, I must jump in and say we are, since we are running late, we really have just about six or seven minutes for questions. That might just be one or two questions, unfortunately. Well, some of the questions relate to the fact that we are so isolated in Congress right now. Uh, all three of the speakers could address this, the fact that uh, just about every progressive uh, legislator in Congress is going to vote for this massive increase in the military budget, as well as all kinds of other military spending. Um, I think we need some comments from our speakers on how we deal with this new reality that the people that we could always depend on in the past uh, to at least raise our issues about military spending uh, are on the other side on this. Well, that's a challenge. <laughs> Uh, to me, I'm I'm uh, uh, I've, I've been so discouraged by uh, by developments, you know, of, uh, you know, even the sort of celebrity uh, Congress people like like uh, AOC uh, uh, has not covered herself with glory on, on the, the question of, of uh, war and peace. It seems to me and. Uh, and and Bernie, you know, I was a I was a Bernie guy for for back in 2016 and 2020 as well. And there again, somehow the conversation has to be changed. I say this because I'm a historian and uh, and I have I believe in the power of talk and ideas. But somehow we have to have more voices intervening in the debate uh that make peace and diplomacy that legitimize diplomacy i mean that's really all we're talking about here at the moment that's the that's the critical thing cr critical issue if we can just get to the point where calling for diplomacy is not viewed as a russian talking point uh it, it's a serious point of view and it's a it's a pro-peace point of view it's not a pro-russian point of view uh but uh but that's that is you know try to get get your voices heard is all you know in, in any any venue you can things may I, I get the impression from this conference that things are a lot more active in the best sense at the local level than they are at the national level and i'm not quite sure how to bridge that divide if i could just jump in with two quick points um in answer to paul's question i think the n number one is and very much what jackson was just saying the key is we have to be louder and stronger and harder to ignore Right now, we can be ignored with very, little with very little consequence for members of Congress. They are not champions of all of our ideas. You know, even the best of our champions are still members of Congress with all those pressures. They are not part of our movement. Some of them come out of our movement, they are the best, but we can't just assume they're gonna do the right thing because it's the right thing. They are who they are. So we have to make it much harder than it is right now for them not to take up these issues. As I said, we need to have consequences. We don't have the money to say we're going to fund their opponents the way APAC does or something. We have to do it by supporting candidates, by walking the, you know, walking the, the precincts for them, et cetera. But we also have to be prepared to have their back when they do something good, even something that's not popular. We've got to support it in ways that most of us, frankly, don't. We don't bother. We don't thank them. We don't go through the motions of all of that. That's number one. Number two, and this, I, I do want to take issue a bit with something that you said, Jackson, about the mass global protests of against the looming, then looming war against Iraq in 2002 and 2003, not having an impact on foreign policy. I really disagree with that. It did not accomplish what that main set of demonstrations was trying to do, which was to prevent that war. Certainly that didn't happen. But the motion that was created by the protests globally of February 15th, 2003, when 14 million people around the world, the world said no to war on that day. It didn't stop the Iraq war, but it did play a major role in preventing a 2007 uh, US war against Iran. It did show what the potential for a global war, a global anti-war movement could look like. It did lead directly in Egypt, for example, to the overthrow of the US backed Mubarak regime. It did, prevent largely the US bombing and the UK bombing of Syria in 2014, although by the next year that was lost, but it did accomplish a great deal more 
than the explicit goal of that protest. And I think it's really, really important, especially for those of us in the peace and justice, the peace side of the peace and justice equation, who so rarely get any kind of a visible victory for our work, to recognize that those victories do exist, they do come, but they don't always come right at the moment for exactly the cause we're fighting for. It can be something just as important 10 years later. And we need to claim those as our own as well. Thank you, I appreciate that, your, your extension and, and correction there. And those things were successful specifically because of the size of, the, of those mobilizations, which exactly. we don't have right now, um, in which we have to figure out. Uh, the next question, let, let me just point out, I think, what do you say, we have two minutes call for <laughs> questions still. Um, I just want to acknowledge that the points, different points of view on Ukraine are all over the questions, all over the comments. Uh, we have three completely contradictory narratives within our movements about Ukraine. Everything from we should, we should be supporting the Ukrainian resistance to Russia, to the US is responsible for this, to uh, Putin is about building an empire. It's all out there, all over our comments. And this is just something we have to keep in mind. We're not gonna obviously resolve this in the last second here. So I'm gonna move on to another, another question that we all do have, I think. Um, but I just wanna acknowledge that and it's a problem we have not figured out how to deal with the completely narrative, different narratives going on among peace forces about the war in Ukraine. And that has really prevented us from doing much about it. Uh, so the question is uh, that I, a very important one, that much of the movement working on very important things, climate change, uh, anti-racism work, uh, dealing with prisons, goes on day to day without any reference at all to this militarism that is surrounding the whole uh, public discussion, that is surrounding the whole world right now and how do we bring militarism into these other really important struggles that people have given their lives over to uh, and yet completely ignored is being ignored uh, in in a lot of these efforts are you calling on someone paul I'm, I'm, any of the three should feel maybe maybe Lindsay should start this. She, she's, yeah. yeah, I mean, Lindsay has worked so hard all these years on giving us what the, what would the military money could be used for and uh, lobbying Congress on it and, and everything else. And, and uh, she might have the best perspective on on how these issues that she's dedicated herself uh -huh. to uh, can be brought into uh, these other really important issues that that uh, are being organized right now. Lindsay is trying to unmute and she can't. Can somebody do that for her? Oh, sorry about that. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, and I'm sorry to say, I missed a little bit of that of that last question because I was typing some response to the, the previous question, but um, uh, the gist of it is, is what can we do? <laughs> bring, yeah, bringing, bringing this militarism issue and, and how it's enveloping the world around us into these other important organizing efforts that, that we see right in front of us right now. Yeah, so one thing I, I would say is that I think we need to give a lot of those organizing efforts more credit, um, especially the newer organizations or movements that may not even be quite organizations yet that are led by young people. Um, they, you know, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard some comments today about, you know, people don't understand these links. A lot of young people really, and, and young people who were invested in organizing on any of these issues really do understand the links. Um, they're quite aware of the problems with militarism and U.S. imperialism and, um, and what the links are between, you know, racism and militarism and climate and all of these things. Um, so I think we need to give them more credit is, is one thing. Um, I also think we need to realize that all of us are spread too thin. Even in this community, we're spread too thin. We have so many things to work on. You know, there's many of us are devoting a lot of energy to Ukraine, but there are still all of these other, you know, we still have a growing presence and a military presence in Africa. We still have this huge um, 
sort of anti-China growing sentiment that is bipartisan and very well accepted and has not enough voices pushing back against it. And that's, you know, I could go on and on and on. Um, so I think we need to give ourselves and other movements more credit, first of all, for what we are doing. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that we don't understand these things, but I do think we can be talking to each other more. Um, and I do think that, you know, that we can accept frames where, um, you know, if we push back on militarism, for example, you know, we at NPP, we push back on militarism and immigration. Um, and it's not, um, it's about having those relationships. It's, and it's not about sort of, you know, are you on my side? Um, because we all are mostly on each other's side in the progressive movement. Um, now Ukraine is an example where there's more division and, and more disagreement and, and that's a tougher one, mm -hmm. uh, but there is so much in militarism that is not just about whether the U S gives military aid to Ukraine. That's an, I don't mean to say that we should downplay that issue or that we should not be, um, hashing that out and working on it, but it can't be the only thing. Um, and we can't see that division as defining us. Um, we also can't see the division between these movements as, as defining us. Lots of young climate organizers understand very well um, that militarism is not their friend. Um, what we can do in the, in the peace movement is we can give other people the tools to make our work easier and to make their work easier um, by being there for them and by, you know, giving them, here's something you can do on militarism um, and not expecting them to come in fully. And, you know, obviously they're not going to put down what they're doing. They can't put down what they're doing. Um, but, but there can be a lot of, of cross pollination and a lot of sharing. Um, and I think that, I think that I really do think that young people are there and just, um, you know, we also have polling that shows that young people are, not bought into U.S. exceptionalism in the same way. They're not bought into U.S. militarism in the same way. Um, so, I, so I think there's a lot to work with there, um, but we just need to recognize that it takes time. It doesn't mean that we aren't heading in the right direction. It doesn't mean that we aren't putting the pieces in place. Um, it just I, th I think I'm afraid as the moderator, okay. I think yes. I need to I'll thank stop. you for ending on this really positive note. I think we do need to see what the good things are that are happening and, and the connections that are being made. But I want to thank all three of you for this amazing presentation. We have a lot to think about and you've given us a lot more to think about. So thank you all and let's uh, get to the next phase of this conference. Um, I'm really sorry we didn't have more time for questions, questions in this panel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, now we're ready for breakouts uh, to respond to the panel that we just heard about.